Before we start the show, we'd like to let you know that we recorded this before the great Ken Howard passed away. We'd like to offer our condolences to his family and friends, and we hope we didn't goof on him too much. Don't miss Ken Howard starring as the White Shadow. When the going gets rough, he can be as tough as he has to be. I don't think there's any way you can make it to the pros. You're not good enough. Or he can be tender. You just reach out and take my hand. He's a very good listener. I mean, there is more to school than basketball. <laughs> oh, really? And a tough coach. You can be easily replaced. The team brings in the problems. The solutions come from the White Shadow. Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. All right, now we're going to talk about The White Shadow. White Shadow aired on CBS from 1978 to 1981. A total of 54 episodes, only one full season, uh, two half seasons uh, around the second full season. And a couple notable things about it. It was created by Bruce Paltrow, uh, father of Gwyneth Paltrow, but also a director, including the movie Duets, favorite here. A classic. Classic. Um, he was also the executive producer of St. Elsewhere. And a lot of people from the show, both uh, on camera and off camera, went on to other things. Notable three of the actors have gone on to uh, pretty solid uh, TV directing careers. Um, Thomas Carter, who played Hayward. Uh, Kevin Hooks, who played Thorpe. And Timothy Van Patten, who played Salami. And uh, all of them are still working today. You see their names crop up. Uh, Timothy Van Patten, in particular, has become like the go-to guy at HBO. He directed a lot of Sopranos, um, directed the pilot, or the second version of the pilot of Game of Thrones, and did uh, like 20 episodes of Boardwalk Empire. Also son of Dick Van Patten. Recently passed away, Dick Van Patten. Uh, and he was also on that ninja show, The Master. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, a bunch of the writers went on to stuff, too. Joshua Brand and John Falsey created St. Elsewhere, Northern Exposure, and I'll Fly Away together. And Joshua Brand is one of the executive producers on The Americans right now mm. on FX. Uh, John Mazius uh, created Touched by an Angel, Providence, and Hawthorne. Uh, and Mark Tinker, um, son of Grant Tinker, and stepson of... <laughs> ex-stepson, I think is what IMDb said, of Mary Tyler Moore, uh, is a writer, director, and producer, and worked on The White Shadow, St. Elsewhere, Chicago Hope, NYPD Blue, uh, and Deadwood, among others. So it's a very kind of storied show in a way. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'm assuming that's no coincidence that so many people went on other things. That must I don't have been think a so. Nurturing I think environment I've heard, for... uh, um, like Tom Fontana, who went on to do Homicide, was on St. Elsewhere, mm -hmm. and He's got a reputation for nurturing his writers and making sure they're always on, you know, get to learn every aspect of the job of producing, like, you know, be on set, be in casting calls and edit and stuff. And I think he learned that from Bruce Paltrow from being on St. Elsewhere. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Also uh, an MTM show, Mary Tyler Moore and Grant Tinker's Company, um, mm -hmm. also known for the Mary Tyler Moore show, Newhart, uh, the first Bob Newhart show. Mm-hmm. Um, St. Elsewhere, a, a lot of really quality shows. Right. Yeah. And their logo's a cat. Yeah. That at the end of The White Shadow plays a basketball, uh, dribbles a basketball. The White Shadow is about uh, a coach played by Ken Howard. His character's named Ken Reeves. He's a ex-Chicago Bull. He had a knee injury, and he's come to L.A. to coach basketball at an inner city school. The principal is an old buddy of his from college, and ropes him into this and over the course of the series he helps these these inner city guys kind of one become better basketball players and become a team like when it starts out it's like the bad news bears they're just terrible and uh by the by the episode we watched the end of season two they're city champs yeah a great turnaround for this <laughs> it, program it really is yeah 
but there's it's it's not all you know it's not all rainbows and sunshine as we'll find out uh and it it dealt with a lot of social issues um kind of before uh, before its time one it had like a, a uh a predominantly african american cast they're like you know i think in season 2 they're like three white guys on the team um two of them are italian and one of them's jewish and there's a, a latino guy and then a bunch of african americans and the principal and the vice principal are both bath- african american and uh you know and they so over the course of it they dealt with issues they, there's an episode about a player who might be homosexual there's a <laughs> infamous episode about pcp and uh, another infamous episode about uh, venereal disease yeah. <laughs> and teenage pregnancy and this one deals with uh, kind of a random death mm-hmm. and it, you know it's like yeah socially conscious tv yeah and these these are the episodes that kind of stand out i think if, yeah. if you ask somebody to remember but i think you make a good point that uh there were a lot of african-american comedies on network tv in those days but right. but uh, dramas with a predominantly african-american it, cast that was a that was a definitely a different yeah, thing and treating them like as realistically as a tv show in 1979 right. could. yeah and actually i mean that's kind of that that type of show isn't as common as as it is generally. I mean, back at, kind of in the seventies, you had more socially relevant dramas, right? As opposed to genre like crime dramas or science fiction, you would have like actual like dramas. And MTM was big, at, like the other one, one of your favorites, Lou Grant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, which is kind of the, roughly the same time period, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so my relationship with the White Shadow, I don't think I I was probably a slightly too young to watch it when it was first on. Um, although I kind of remember like seeing the first episode, like maybe we were traveling in a hotel room and my dad just left it on CBS cause that's what he did. Um, but then, uh, it was on in reruns a lot in the afternoon, a little later. And it was right around the time I was like, really got into basketball and was kind of like becoming more socially conscious myself, I guess. So it, it like tapped into a lot of things I was interested in. I remember watching it pretty religious, religiously in reruns and then seeing it in various different ways as an adult. Uh, and for the most part, I think it holds up. It's a little goofy sometimes, <laughs> you know, and it's, but it wears its heart on its sleeve and that that's part of what makes it goofy Yeah, because that's hard to do. But I think that's another hallmark of a lot of those shows of that era, those dramas, yeah. they do wear their hearts on their sleeves and they, they're, they're sincere and, and sometimes like the, the earnestness of, not only the characters, but you can tell that the show is, is putting a message out there. Right. And, you know, you can have mixed results with that. But I think White Shadow, I think that, I, I agree with you. I think they, it holds up uh, very well today. It's a very entertaining show. Yeah. And you got a lot of basketball. And you get, it, the other thing they were doing that, I, I guess maybe just because it was targeted at adults, nobody cared. But it was clear these guys had sex. Mm-hmm. They drank. Yeah. They did drugs sometimes. <laughs> I mean, they drink in this episode. That's a big plot point. So, uh and we should talk about the episode, and the name of it is The Death of Me, or close yes, to the, that. Yes, The Death of Me Yet. Question. The Death of Me Yet, with a yeah. question mark. So, this is not the season finale, although it sure feels like it. Yeah, it really does. It's near the end of the the, the second season. Um, okay. Uh, a couple th- things of side interest. The, uh, Coach Reeves has a girlfriend in this, a fellow teacher, and that got set up in another episode uh, we, we talked about, maybe. Uh, watching called Salami's Affair um, that yeah. focused on Salami. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in this episode, they, the uh, I think the episode opens with them kind of winning the game that's like a playoff game that's going to get them into the city championship. And you get a speech, and it's it, it's got a like interesting editing style. Like some of the audio of his speech is playing over the game, and then the, you know they're cutting to that. And, uh, so they win the game, and it's a big deal and part of it the big deal is just that a lot of these guys are graduating um part of it is that it's put uh coach reeves on the map and he might start getting offers from other places and possibly taking them yeah and everybody's aware of that too by the way like yeah. it's it's spoken about openly like uh they're worried about you know at, at carver high they, they right it's on their mind too that hey he might be too too good for us to keep him here yeah and, you know, he's, I don't know what exactly what happened to his basketball money, although 
you know, I'm sure in the 70s, the basketball money wasn't that great. Probably not, yeah. But <laughs> he lives in a kind of dumpy apartment and drives a station wagon. Yeah. <laughs> so either he didn't make much or he didn't save it. Yeah, this isn't like a former athlete like today where he would have made like $20 million right out of the draft and, and been right. able to bank that. I mean, he's, yeah. he's got to work for a living, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, pretty early on, we get the guys, they're having a party. They're celebrating. They are having a party. They are. They they got some great generic Mike Post music playing on the record. Yes, yeah, some player. Some royalty free uh, music. <laughs> they got some. Uh, they're dancing a little bit. They're yeah, all, and they're all in a, an apartment. And I don't know whose apartment that is, but yeah, I don't think they established that. But no. uh, it's it's a pretty spacious apartment. They got a lot of people crammed in there, though. Yeah, not just the team. They got some. They, they got the the man the equipment manager, who's the guy who. Uh, accidentally took the PCP in the other episode and uh, he apparently procured them the booze uh, at least started out there's something yeah. about that or the ladies something mm. yeah he gets a shout out a lot <laughs> of times he just sat in the background you know? <laughs> so he, he gets some credit and you got Gomez is just sitting there with his girlfriend they're just sitting there yeah you know? <laughs> just hanging out enjoying the vibe yeah and they realize they're out of booze I think that's part of Gomez drank a lot of it Ah, uh, that's probably why he's sitting there so quiet. Yeah. yeah. And somebody's got to go get the booze. So uh, one of the players, Jackson, Curtis Jackson, he gets sent because uh, he doesn't drink. And I that was the previous storyline, too, that he had uh, basically become an alcoholic. Ah, uh, yeah. And okay. got cleaned up. Okay. The, they didn't say that. They didn't say, they that, didn't say that, but it's, yeah. Because uh, they say he's, he's the only one straight enough to go right to be able to basically walk. Uh, well, yeah, walk a upright. few blocks. To- yeah. <laughs> so I, okay, that makes sense. I, yeah. I I missed that. I didn't didn't get that. But and so he agrees to go. His girlfriend doesn't want him to go. Now let me mention Who one also thing. Also appeared in the Salami's affair. She asked him to the Sadie Hawkins dance. The girlfriend. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So this is there's some continuity. So there's there's something. This isn't just somebody he's met at the party that he's making time with. It's, no, it's, it's like there's actually something seeing, going on there. You know, for like ten episodes. Okay, that actually makes me feel better. Yeah. Uh, because I was very upset during the episode that you know he's got a he's clearly uh, got a chance with this girl here and things are going and well. The guys. And and it's it's seemed to me really poor form for them to pick him. Yeah. To be the one and leave her and go. You know. Right. Even though. He, no matter how it far probably away. is still poor form because these these guys are not always the, <laughs> they're not always good to each other. No, and maybe they don't no. have as much uh, you know practice at you know underage drinking, which maybe is a good thing. Right, but uh, it seems to me like a little bit of a faux pas to send send that guy, yeah. especially if he's an alcoholic. Right. Well, I guess they trust he's not going to drink it. I mean, he's sitting there at the party not drinking, so yeah. But it seems particularly unfair, right, to to make him go do it. Yeah. Uh, and one other thing I want to mention before we get to, to what happens when he goes to get the booze is no. that Salami's wearing sunglasses inside the whole time at the party, <laughs> which is pretty cool. He's, he's wearing his sunglasses at night, man, and uh-huh. he's, he's loving life, clearly. That's nice. That, I, I don't think I picked up on that, but... Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's that's no shame cool. in that. There's no shame in that, but I, I did uh, want to mention nice detail. that. Yeah, thank you. He, he didn't want anybody to know he was drunk. Yeah. He, he was hiding his bloodshot eyes. He, he did a brilliant job because I couldn't see those, right. those eyes. Or those maybe big shades he was this all falls on Salami. Maybe he wasn't drunk either. It was hiding his non-bloodshot eyes. Yeah, he was just too lazy to go to the store yeah, exactly. to, to booze himself. Yeah. And he's still recovering from the trauma of sleeping with his teacher. Uh, could be. So. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> his cousin could have gone. I don't know if the cousin was at the party. The, the other Italian guy. Nick. Uh, who, who wasn't he wasn't like a he became more prominent in the third mm. season and then there's goldstein i don't know if he was there either uh, sometimes there are these scenes where it, it's implied that everyone's there there's a scene right. later where it's implied the whole team's there and then the whole team is not there yeah 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 i don't remember if goldstein was at the party i remember yeah. seeing him later in the episode but poor jackson the, yeah jackson to goes go to the, the liquor store yeah. he gets i think he gets some beer he gets he gets a little bit of everything uh He's already paid for it, mm-hmm. and a guy comes in to hold up the store. And the cashier pulls a shotgun, the guy shoots the cashier, and then he looks at Jackson. They cut the close-up of Jackson. He's like, 
no man or yeah. something and then he gets killed yeah jackson was clearly an innocent bystander yeah totally and, and the cops later you hear someone recounting it yeah they figured they out, totally figured out they the reconstructed what happened the the and actually i think the the cashier he he basically gave him the money and then shot him right like on the way yeah. like right yeah that's he really right. didn't need to do it i mean it, it's it's it kind of makes it a little bit more of a waste but yeah and his that's sad it is. It's, yeah. it's even if you don't know the character that well. Yeah, and it must have been incredibly. Sh- I don't know how they promoted this episode. I'd be curious right. to know, but it must have been very shocking. I know, would think in, so. Yeah, nineteen seventy nine or eighty or whatever to see that. Yeah, one of the main characters, and especially after the high of the 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 celebration, and, and this is like the peak of, of Carver High and their their journey as basketball players, and all of a sudden one of their players is shot in this like almost random event. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Now I would say in terms of the cast, and I don't. I don't remember if he was a starter on the team, but uh, you know he's probably like second tier. Hmm. Like you got your Coolidge and your Salami and your Hayward and your Thorpe. Yeah, I feel like that's the top tier. Yeah, and then there's like Jackson and Reese. Okay, and maybe Gomez. Yeah, Gomez doesn't. I always forget that he was on the show. Yeah, <laughs> and Goldstein. Yeah, you know, those guys are the next level. Right. But uh, but he's still an important member of the, the cast. And memorable just for his hat. Yeah. As a sort of denim beret yes <laughs> becomes important in this episode later um so we cut from that moment to the next morning and coach reeves is in his office and the, the assistant principal comes down and is trying to tell him what happened and he's just like it's one of those classic scenes you'll see all the time like yeah just like ah you know just like what do you want oh fine i'll get to you later uh ah, what and then she tells him Right, he thinks she's just going to like make life difficulties. She's got yeah. some some kind of like administrative thing or something. She's going to get in his case about. Right, it. He and I to... think he had just gotten a call from the college that like right before he talked to her, right? Yeah, or it's like during the, like the, yeah, yeah, you're right. He she comes in and and wants to talk to him, and then I think he gets the call before she tells him what right, happened. Right, that's but, right. He goes up to her yeah. office and she tells him, and so the call surprise guest star. I mean, it was a surprise to me. I didn't pick it for that reason, but yeah. but kind of a. Uh, a big, uh, a regular presence on seventies TV, wouldn't you say? As guest star, who yeah. later became became a movie star. That's correct. I'll let you say because yeah, I was surprised too. It was uh, Jamie Cromwell. Jamie, Cr- <laughs> I, I I I was confused. I think he was billed. Is that as, how he's credited? I think in like I thought in like uh, maybe not as late as Revenge of the Nerds, but there was something early that he was billed as Jamie Cromwell. Uh-huh. And I don't know if he was in this episode. I didn't see. Right. But yeah, the 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 great James Cromwell. It's funny because I've seen him in other things where he was younger, but in this one he didn't seem young at all. He seemed like the appropriate to be. Yeah, he seemed like older than Coach Reeves. You know, yeah. he, just, he had that kind of air about him already in this in this role. Right, I mean, and he's like the athletic director at college, another in the L.A. area. Yes, like I don't know if they s- say what it is. No, I, I think they had a name. Okay, but, but it, it was a fictional. Yeah, I feel like maybe it was supposed to be like like Pepperdine Cal- or something. Yeah, like mm-hmm. California U or something yeah. like that. Some, but yeah. <laughs> Right, a and, nice school, and he pretty much makes him an offer. Yeah, he's like even if he doesn't win the city championship, he's already good enough to get an offer. And he, you know, I think they end the conversation with, um, you know, at least give me the the first shot. Yeah, like if like you get if other you offers, come let back me match to me. It. Let me match yeah, it exactly. And then they kind of agree that he's going to go down there and yeah. visit later. But uh, so then the coach finds out about the death. And obviously, it, it really knocks him down and sort of his conflict for the rest of the show one is maybe i should just go to the college because i'm not doing any good here like if if and he finds out like he kind of already knew but a lot of these guys who are graduating don't have any plans like reese and goldstein i don't think have any plans hayward i think is has a college lined up i think those are the three guys graduating reese and goldstein don't have anything he doesn't know what these other guys are going to do and some of them are not the brightest bulbs you know yeah uh they try but uh yeah he feels this like existential thing about like what what have i done you know yeah, if, if one other of other than make him a good basketball right team. he was trying to keep his his kids away from the kind of thing that happened to jackson he was yeah. he thought that this would insulate them from that and this is kind of a, a reminder that the uh, the real world is still is still there and, and you know what's right. it all for and so that's yeah. definitely weighing heavily on him in this episode and then we get a uh, I, one of the best scenes i thought was when a bunch of the guys on the team are sitting around in the bleachers talking about it. Uh, and kind of before that, you also uh, get the question, are they even going to play the game? 
like the coach is already thinking about yeah. that. Like he's thinking he doesn't want to. Like what's the point? And he, but he's going to leave it up to them. Yeah. Now this is interesting. This is something I wanted to ask you about. Uh, one thing I want to ask you: Do you think they should have played the game? Uh, and if it's at all possible, would you have played the game? Like today, I don't. I don't know if they would have gone and played the game in that second circum- that kind of circumstance. I don't think it would have been an option. I yeah, think they would have just there postponed it or some, something. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it, I'm. I think they. I think it was right that they did. Like that was a good way to cope with it. I think. Right. It was just do what they had all worked together to do, and. Um, you know, I don't think they intend it to come out, come this way necessarily, but it's interesting because like a lot of times when Coach Reeves is asking them, yeah, he's basically he kind of makes it sound like there's no point because they won't be able to play their best. Right. He doesn't say like, oh, it's just in poor taste. <laughs> like they don't really address that angle. Yeah, I don't at think all. the taste angle is there, right? and they don't really say like Jackson would have wanted it. They just are doing it because that's what they do, and and yeah. they don't explicitly say that. And it does seem like there's a little bit. Maybe not with them, but with another character later of also like him trying to break through sort of macho stuff and yeah, be like it's okay if you don't want to play, you know. Right. He's he's almost trying to get them to acknowledge the fact that you know yeah, yeah. to be emotional about it. And yeah. When you know they're in a culture where not just I mean I think they're their environment, but also just being athletes to like there's a lot in being men. It's, it's yeah, you know their nature not to do it, but I think them choosing to do it it makes sense to me from a grief standpoint that you know sometimes work yeah which that's essentially what that is for them is good so they we see them they're sitting around in the bleachers and Mm -hmm. uh so hayward had gone down to the liquor store and basically seen the cops there and seen jackson's body and found out what happened uh found this hat this iconic hat and his sunglasses and uh they just have this talk, and they're and while they're talking, they just kind of very subtly like pass the hat back and forth. And it's not even like I, I I don't think it's like pass the hat and then say something. They're just passing it around. Yeah, you know. And then they decide to play the game, and you get it like Hayward's kind of feels guilty, and kind of you know he saw it, so that bothers him. But they all feel a little guilty about yeah sending him. It, it's one of those things where I, I think it's like it's not explicit, it's unspoken, but it's clear. It's it's well presented in that scene. Yeah. And you're right, that is an excellent scene. They're not like openly saying like they're not they're not they're they're saying a lot without uh, saying a lot. And even when they decide to play the game, as I recall, they don't actually. I think they say something like, "Is anybody not in favor of playing the game?" They sort right. of all realize at the same time that that that's what they got to do. That they got to play the game, but they don't they don't really do it so much in a formal way of going around and having everybody make a speech about it but it just sort of comes out uh, of the way they're talking. So you're right. That's an excellent scene. Yeah. And then it kind of ends, like one of them leaves the hat on the bleachers and Hayward comes back and gets it. And then the coach comes in and it's kind of like, why didn't you call me? Yeah. And, but to ask about the, them playing the game and stuff. And, uh, and then later we see him go visit this college, mm-hmm. which looks like a really nice college. thing. <laughs> they're showing off the gym and the facilities and they, you know, they have, uh, all sorts of like physical therapy stuff, and it, that's just great. And and the I don't know if it was intentional casting, but the like the one player he meets is like, well, it looks like a lot like Ken Howard. <laughs> He's very blonde and blue eyed, and like yeah, totally the opposite of right. all of these guys. I mean, there's clearly a message that he's going to have the, the finest facilities. He's not yeah. going to have to worry about these quote unquote social issues. Uh, yeah, he's going to be making college. a good living. Yeah. So and clearly, a great opportunity. He's definitely considering it at that point. It's definitely there, and and his girlfriend is sort of trying to, I think, dissuade him from that. Mm. And there, there are a few little uh, scenes together, and just trying to get through his grief to and help him. And then, uh, and they, and the students find out, like that they know, like you said, the, that he's looking at other places, and he's just like, eh, I haven't decided yet. And then later, there's a scene in the locker room, and there's this kid. <laughs> getting Jackson's stuff out of his locker. And it turns out it's his little brother. And the coach gives him a ride home, and they're talking. And the kid basically tells him, you know, that he plays basketball, and, you know, and he wants to play for him someday because how much Jackson or Curtis talked about him and stuff. And he explained why he, he likes basketball so much. It's because when he's playing, that that's all he thinks about. Like he doesn't have to think about all the stuff in their neighborhood. And, now his brother being dead and all that and that really 
comes back later, but it, it moves the coach a lot. And he, he was played by a kid with a very cool name. Oh, really? Yeah, I gotta see if I can find it here. This is Jackson's younger younger brother. Jackson's younger brother. I'll cut some of this out. <laughs> Famous last words from a podcast. I'll yeah. cut this out. It's a. It is a good scene though in the car. Oh, here I we mean, go. here we go. Uh, uh, Beanie Williams. Beanie Williams. Uh, very good. Beanie yes. Williams played Jackson's brother. He he plays the the role for a kid. He has a lot more gravitas than you might think of somebody named Beanie. Yes, <laughs> he gets he gets the he, he he does a good job. I mean, he's 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 yeah, a kid. He, he's and he a looks kid, like yeah. a kid appropriately, like a kid. But there's some it's emotional uh, part of the show there. Yeah, and then we get to the 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 day of the big game. They go to <laughs> they go to the uh, uh, the basketball arena. I'm not sure which one it is. It, I don't think it's the forum. It didn't say the forum on it. So maybe it's where the Clippers used to play. Uh, like the old sports arena or something? I think maybe. that's what it says. Right? Yeah, the yeah. LA sports arena. Yeah, I think that's what it is. And, you know, they're all feeling it. That's, they're in this big place. And and Thorpe, who's always a little bit of a, <laughs> you know, tries to put on a show mm. about how cool he is. He's like, ah, this is my kind of, yeah, I, I don't get nervous and everything. And then, of course, right before the game, he's in the bathroom throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they set that. It's interesting because they set up in the the, the uh, you know the little preview at the beginning, like that that is being a much more dramatic thing, <laughs> right? Like you know something bad happened, and then you're like oh, where's Thorpe? Yeah, and it's right before the game, right? <laughs> yeah, he's just throwing up. Yeah, and then <laughs> this may be the, the the in a way the best part of the show. They start the game. Smash cut, they've won the game. <laughs> right. There yeah. is no game You see game very little of the game. At least at the beginning, you saw a little bit of the game, yeah. at the playoff game. But this game, yeah, there's <laughs> there's no basketball action. Yeah. And uh, it's another, they do some of the fun editing with that, I think. But it's, it's just, yeah. <laughs> I, you don't, you don't, I had a good laugh. You don't always see a lot of uh, of what makes Coach Ken a great uh, game day coach. <laughs> no. In these, uh, Mostly it's him just yelling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he's pretty low key in this episode. Like yeah. even his his pregame speeches are pretty low key. Yeah, yeah. Like the first one is basically like, ah, hey, it's our time, you know, and, and it's very calm and and low key. Right. And then I guess before the well for the championship game. Yeah. I guess he just excites them with the, like his big news. That yeah, that he's staying. Right. And they because yeah. they they pretty much were assuming he was going. I guess. Right. Yeah. So. So and pretty yeah pretty much the talk with this kid sealed the deal that he was going to stay. Yeah. Like he had a reason to stay. I guess it would be pretty funny if he told them he was uh, staying, and then after the game he said, yeah. ah, you know what, I think I'm going to leave. I, I've accomplished everything I could. And then right. <laughs> can I just betrayed them like that? <laughs> and actually, now that I remember, the, the cut is not to them. It's <laughs> cut from the beginning of the game to them getting their trophies. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they they get rid of all that extraneous uh, basketball uh, stuff. Yeah. And, and get to the... And there the coach gives a nice, uh, before he gives Jackson's trophy to his brother. Yeah. He gives a nice speech and talks about that talk and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a good episode. It is good. And uh, one, one other thing I want to mention, I don't, I don't know if we mentioned yet, um, earlier in the episode there's a scene where after they win the playoff game, Jackson comes into uh, Coach's office. Oh, yeah. And basically kind of going to your theme of, like, guys not saying things right. when they mean it, he gives an awkward speech where he's basically trying to t- say basically thanks, and Coach Ken basically completes it and says, yeah, you want to say thanks yeah. for, you know. <laughs> He's basically thanking him for molding him into this and for getting him here and, and, yeah. and helping him like grow as a person, and it it's, it winds up going unsaid. But he's just, yeah, yeah, thanks, you know. And he's kind of relieved that he doesn't actually have to say it, right? And because Coach Reeves said it for him. Because every all the other players have already done that. Yeah, <laughs> this, he's been through this. But and he had, I think maybe he says something that he had done the same thing when he was, you know, yeah. given the same speech to a coach of his. Yeah. Stuff. And in retrospect, it's easy to kind of say, "Oh, yeah, something bad was going to happen," because that scene kind of like foreshadows that. Definitely, interesting bit of uh, trivia: his college coach, Bob Cousy. Bob Cousy. This Greek also Bob came Cousy. up in the Salami's Affair episode. Wow. Uh, he's talking to his, his then to the woman he's pl- his girlfriend in this episode, and you know talks about why he went to Boston College, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Why?" Because Bob Cousy was there. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And I know there's an episode somewhere where um, uh, a great basketball player shows up. Yeah. <laughs> Whose name I just forgot. Yeah. Uh, Boston Celtics center. Bill Russell? Bill Russell. 
Well, Bill Russell was also on the uh, the Saturday Night Live. Uh, there, there's an episode Bill Russell hosted of Saturday Night Live yeah. where he was in the Black Shadow, ah. where the idea was he was a coaching like white guys, you right? Know? Yeah. And uh, that was that was pretty funny, as I recall. That's good. Much much better than I would have thought a Bill Russell hosted episode would be. Ew, yeah. That was, yeah. That was that was I think the original cast uh, that episode, yeah. but yeah, it was, it's a good episode and it's a good show. Uh, I personally, I, I didn't watch it a lot at all when it was on, and I don't even remember seeing it in reruns. Yeah. And, you know, I was a kid, I was into sports, and it seems to me like this, not only that, but um, when I was young, I went through a phase where I was reading a lot of, uh, aimed at, like, juvenile fiction with, like, urban settings. Like, uh, yeah. back then, you know, they'd call them, like, ghetto novels or something right. like that. And I remember reading those and, and sort of being interested in that. And even into, like, junior high, maybe, like, early junior high reading those, so... This is the kind of thing that if it had been on in reruns, I, I probably would have eaten this up. But yeah. I didn't really watch a whole lot of it until until uh, later when I was an adult. Right. So, like, when I watched it in reruns, a lot of times I'd watch it and then go out and shoot baskets. Yeah. <laughs> and make right. up my... Like, I had a whole uh, anyway, fictional basketball team that I made up. Nice. They were pros, but, okay. you know, it was the same idea. It was definitely, you know, uh, inspired... With Coach but, uh, Ken as the uh, coach of your team? No, but it had a lot of melodrama like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. You had, on your team, you had a lot of melodrama? Yeah, yeah. Like, I was the basketball part, I just, it wasn't as interesting to me as. Yeah. You're, I liked the basketball, but I already knew instinctively. The basketball you would take care of You can't do a TV itself. show just about basketball. No. It's got to be about what's happening. Yeah. You know, when you're not on the court. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, yeah, I, I think White Shadow may be one of the. I, I don't know, was there a better sports show than. A regular sports show than White Shadow. I, I mean, know, most there? of them failed. There was the Bad News Bears sitcom. Yeah, which which failed. Yeah. Uh, there was First and Ten on HBO, the okay. football show. Yeah. Uh, every now and then you'll get a you'll, there was that Dean Kane baseball show. I think it was Dean Kane or something a couple of years ago. Yeah. Every now and then people try, and then there was Playmakers on ESPN. Right. But uh, no, of course, this had the advantage of being two things. It was a basketball show and it was a high school show. And high right. school shows don't always work either. True. Like, you got to have a hook there, too. Mm-hmm. You know, it can't just be eh, as people going to school. Yeah. Like, I guess, well, there's, uh, what's the one from the 60s? Uh, room room 222. Yeah. Room two, yeah. And that's a similar kind of school, right? Mm-hmm. Like an inner yeah. city school. Or yeah, I think there was a big, like, ethnic mix in there. But I, I think it was like a, yeah, I think it was like a Los Angeles area. Right. School, yeah. Yeah, so... I don't think there's there's probably hasn't been I can't think of one off the top of my head a better sports show but there haven't been too many they don't don't try that I'm it's kind of a I guess there's the, that LeBron James produced show on Stars or something now which I haven't seen yeah. but it, it, I uh, guess well, Ballers on HBO yeah 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 White Shadows is a pretty distinctive series and it it's it holds up and but it also stands out because of the, like the social issues because of the, the sports theme and it has shown up by it's been on NBA TV, ESPN Classics. Yeah. Uh, it's on DVD, but it's, it still seems to me to be pretty pretty far under the radar. But it seems like the people that watched it uh, remember it uh, pretty fondly and have vivid memories of, of certain episodes. So, yeah. I, I guess you know, I think its legacy goes on even in more than just that that big director writer tree of, of behind the scenes talent. But right, and it's one of the uh, one of the most important shows in the whole Tommy Westfall universe. Ah, uh, okay. Because uh, <laughs> the character Coolidge, who's the center on the show and the, the you know the tall guy, later showed up as an orderly in the hospital in St. Elsewhere. Yeah. So already, I mean that just that, and it was definitely him because, <laughs> and I remember distinctively uh, definitely seeing this in a hotel room because that was another show I like, that was a show like I wanted to watch but it was on too late. St. Elsewhere. Yeah, but yeah. I think my parents watched it made my brother watch it a little bit uh he was older um where timothy van patten plays a patient and coolidge like sees him is like calling him salami yeah really <laughs> this guy's just looking at him like he's crazy yeah and then of course so if you don't know that saint elsewhere ended with this famous finale that indicates that the whole show was in the mind of this uh autistic kid who's just looking in a snow globe and then people have taken that and the connections and basically the idea is that all of TV is inside this kid's head. <laughs> right. You can find this on the internet somewhere. Yes. Tommy Westfall Universe. And, uh, it, uh, but I think that that's like one of the big connectors. And then a couple of St. Elsewhere characters showed up on Homicide later. 
Mm. And then since Munch from Homicide has been on a bunch of shows, like like he's connective tissue too. Yeah. Because he met them and then. So all these shows, yeah. all these fake shows are, are yeah. really fake. They're really fake. Because they're, they're all just in this. In uh, the head of this child. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to say I like Ken Howard a lot too. Yeah, he is. He's 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 very uh, he's very charismatic in this show. Yeah, I like it. he's got that little New York accent just a little mm. bit, and um, and when he shows up and stuff now, even I just oh, it's Ken Howard. Yeah, he's he was on a bunch of episodes as Thirty Rock, as like a sort of a, the owner of a Comcast like company that was buying NBC. Yeah, um, he was on Curb Your Enthusiasm as a very white guy um, at a golf course. Yeah, and I forgot. I was looking at he was the villain in Michael Clayton. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, he's still out there doing work, and he's the current head, uh, president of SAG or yeah. SAG after. Right, he's 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 still out there. Yeah, and, and yeah, he did, did a he, lot of Broadway and stuff when he was younger. Yeah, it was uh, seventeen seventy six. Oh yeah, that's yeah. He was, he was uh, uh, Jefferson, I think. Yeah. So yeah, he's 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 done a lot of stuff. Yep. Uh, but. To a lot of people, I'm sure it'll be Coach Reeves, and he was he was great in the show. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be watching more. Uh, definitely be watching more White yeah. Shadows. So that's streaming on Hulu. Um, unfortunately, a couple episodes seem to be missing. One of them involves the Harlem Globetrotters, mm. and one of them I think is the one we were looking at uh, episodes. Is Coolidge's house burns down? <laughs> he moves in with the coach. Yeah, I don't know why that one would be. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know what's would be important missing, about that. what the holdup would be for that. Some kind of music <laughs> issue. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of music, too, it's, it's this is a really good theme song. It is. It's, uh, it's like a got a lot of horns. It's a dance, kind of funky dance song. Yeah, it's got a little funk. Uh, Mike Post and Pete Carpenter, known for many theme songs in the TV. And, uh, yeah, that, that's some of their, their best work, and it really sets the... It says something about the show. It's, it's also fun to listen to. It, yeah. It's it's kind of cool. It's, it's it's good for that show because the show was was very serious, but you know, there were a lot of lighthearted moments even within this episode. Yeah. And that theme song is it's kind of a fun you know up tempo kind of thing that gets things going. Yeah. It's definitely one of the one of the best theme songs of the era. Yeah. The White Shadow. Two points. I don't know. You're saying nothing but net for this. Nothing episode? but net. There we go. That's that's <laughs> that's a the better basketball analogy. <laughs> it was awesome, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trifecta, right? It's, it's, yes, yes. It's got a good acting, the good writing, and the uh, cool theme song. Yeah, I think that's all the show needs. Exactly. There you go. You know, you could have two of those and be okay. Yeah, you get three of them, and, and yeah. you're an eternal classic. Right. Okay. This segment brought to you by the Carver High Pep Squad. This segment also brought to you by Goop. Gwyneth's dad made the white shadow. Gwyneth made Goop. This segment also brought to you by Salon. What we'd like to see. time for our uh, what we'd like to see and uh we've been we, we like to talk about things that we can see and that we have seen but there's also a lot of stuff out there that uh as far as we know we can't see but we'd like to and that's, that's what right. this segment's all about <laughs> <laughs> this is uh th- these are more rare things uh things that you you probably won't find on a streaming service or on your uh dvd shelf at the store this is from September fourth, nineteen seventy eight, and these are real things. Things that wow. actually. So you're not just saying a show; you're you're also saying an episode. Well, this is a special. Oh, a special. This Ooh. isn't an episode. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a one-time event. Yes, this is a one-time event. All right. I'll uh, I'll give you the title and, and I'll see if you can guess actually what this might be about. This is a real piece of Americana. The thirty-six most beautiful girls in Texas. It was on ABC, and it's something again. It's a great Ernie Anderson title because you can picture the promo: the thirty-six most beautiful girls in Texas. I'm, well, I assume it's about the 36 most beautiful girls in Texas. It might be a beauty contest, a fashion uh, beauty pageant. That's okay. 
You're you're on the right track, but actually this is about the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Oh, duh. Now this is like nineteen the late seventies when there was a big effort to put the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders over as like not just a cheerleading team, but like right. American icons. And this was part of that effort. And there was actually like a, a huge TV movie uh, that did uh, really big ratings, like a, a fictional movie uh, about the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And for a while, I guess it was thought they'd, they'd be real stars and they'd branch out mm-hmm. and other things. This, I would like to see this not just for the, you know, not just for the reason of seeing 36 cheerleaders or whatever. <laughs> but let me tell you who was in this special, okay? Besides the 36. Besides the 36 most right. beautiful girls in Texas. It was hosted by Hal Linden. Nice. Just the idea of Hal Linden, you know, I can I can just picture him doing this as as a pro, but just kind of a, a mixture of like lightheartedness and you know and yeah. and giving some credibility. Uh, what do you think he was wearing? <laughs> Good question. Was it a tuxedo affair? I don't think so. I'm going to tell you tell you why. I think it was a mix of, of different elements of like different scenes put together. Mm-hmm. I'm picturing him like. Uh, Kind of an, something more casual, maybe maybe looking more like a sportscaster or what, or something like that. Maybe a blazer or something. Yeah. Do you think there's a scene at uh, any point where they're all standing in the line like the Rockettes, and he like maybe does a number with them? Even I was just thinking walking down the line, like I don't know, saying hi to all of them. But now I'm thinking because he he's a song and dance man. Yeah, he he could definitely pull that off. I'm thinking more they they probably did an entry where they they all say their names like going down one by one, yeah. and how Lennon is just like you know, makes some theatrical hand gesture and introduces them as they pan up to you know some Busby Berkeley like view of all them, and, right? And some like the the cowboy star or something yeah. that they would have formed. I don't know, but I, I'd like to see how Lennon doing that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but listen to who else is in this special. Okay. Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal. Charles Nelson Riley. Charles Nelson Riley. And. Joey Travolta, oh, not John Travolta. No. Joey Travolta. Joey Travolta. I've seen his one movie. So, <laughs> but you haven't. I'm. I should just ask this, just to be sure. You haven't seen this uh, special already, have you? I don't think so. Okay. I. But you know what? What year did it come out? It was in 1978. 1978. No, there's a good chance my neighbor did. Like I had a neighbor who was a Cowboys fan, uh-huh. the same age as me. Yeah. His parents also let him watch stuff. That, I'm, I'm like, sh- they took him to The Jerk, <laughs> which I know in retrospect, The Jerk is not. Yeah, that was, was an R-rated rated R. movie, was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, but I don't, it's not, <laughs> right. it's pretty tame rated right. R. I but mean, still. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe because he was, you know, the only child and maybe they couldn't afford a babysitter or something. Yeah. They just took him to The Jerk. Okay. But So he might have, he might have been watching this. Yeah. Well, it, so it's September, probably getting everybody ready for the, for football season. Right. Uh, and I... From my research, I figured out it looks like I don't know if they might have done profile pieces on the cheerleaders, but they also had footage of practice routines, of course, uh-huh. um, some game footage of them actually cheerleading during a game, and uh, some bit where they went to Six Flags. Now, in addition, I found out what the, those guest stars, what roles they did during the show, and okay. this kind of reveals a little bit of what this series was, what this special was probably about. Yeah. Charles Nelson Riley played their cheerleading coach. That makes sense. Uh, Joey Travolta was a starstruck groundskeeper, so he was probably pining away for them mm-hmm. or something like that. And there was probably some, some yeah, business where he was like fumbling over, you know, stuff and like right. accidentally yeah. almost running over his foot with a lawnmower, yeah, stuff like that. Exactly. Billy Crest, Billy Crystal was a depressed hot dog vendor, and the description I read in a, an original uh, newspaper article, a uh, little little piece in a, in a Texas newspaper. Although they spelled it hot god vendor. A I'm hot assuming god vendor. I'm assuming they meant hot dog vendor. <laughs> Unless there's something else, some seventies thing. In Texas they they have hot hot gods. Yeah. It's a, it's a hot gods. Is this a G O T? Yes. So it wasn't even that they just well that would be a, a hot god vendor that would be different too. Yes. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> this and from what I, I read uh that Got apparently hot gods here. Yeah. Yeah, so at some point, Billy Crystal did his Howard Cosell impersonation oh, in the special, which is not surprising at all. Well, where, what, uh, this is air on ABC? This was well, ABC. You did this, right, you said. Yeah, this is a- ABC, a- and, uh, yeah, apparently it was a happening, and I guess it did okay, but... But uh, Hal Linden played himself. Yeah, Hal Linden was hosting. was hosting, so yeah. I don't know if he interacted in these... I, I, I hope that he was in these skits, like, interacting as Hal Linden, like as a bemused spectator, like interacting with, interviewing like Billy Crystal and Joey Trolls' characters right. as if they were real, actual people, you know, yeah. involved with the team. But 
unfortunately, I don't know anymore because I I can't see it. I don't I don't think it's on YouTube or anything. But uh, if somebody knows, someone must have yeah beta maxed it. I'm thinking I'm thinking there were a lot of guys that probably beta maxed <laughs> it. If you know what I mean. Uh, you, yes. You, you think you think it would have. It probably had, you know, a certain appeal, but it's you'd think it would be a pretty sought after, uh, pretty sought after special, but yeah. the kind of thing that you probably won't see on DVD. But it would be uh, an interesting piece of uh, of seventies pop culture that I'd like to see, and I'm imagining there was some kind of cheesy uh, disco influenced uh, opening to it as well. So yeah, maybe Billy Crystal will do the next one man show about <laughs> about his experience about that, or just that that period of his career where he wasn't. You know, he was a, he was in stuff a lot. Yeah, but he he wasn't a star yet. Right. He was probably like a, I guess yeah. he might have been on soap at the time, maybe. Yeah. Like probably. as a supporting player and had his, on that, and you know, his weird SNL thing that happened, and yeah, where he was almost on the first show and then right. wasn't. And uh, yeah. <laughs> to me, this sounds this sounds like a winner. It does. So th- that's that's my choice for for today. Is uh, that's something that I would like to see. Okay. That was. What we'd like to see. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network Shows. Learn more, leave feedback, and suggest future episodes at battleofthenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at Batnet Shows and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Battle of the Network Shows. On the White Shadow. I bet the girls are just crazy about you. Salami's involvement with his teacher goes beyond the classroom. Tuesday at 8, 7 central.